Faith must always precede sight. Once you put sight in front of faith, you've negated faith. Faith is based on what you do not see. If you got to see it first, you won't see it. The euphemism of walking in the Bible means to live according to because you're moving with the mind of Christ. You're not just doing that on Sunday morning when it's church time because he wants to know that you want him. So if you're in distress, don't let that drive you away, draw you near, closer, so that you're like Jacob and say, I'm not going to let you go until you answer me. So welcome to the fire. You get close and want to live for him, want to please him, want to honor him, want to exalt him, want to draw near to him, then heaven opens up and he lets you find him. He lets you find him. Welcome to the fire. I want to begin our time by going over today how the world works. Because many Christians do not understand how the world works. Because we do not understand how the world works, we approach issues in an illegitimate way. Because we're operating on a faulty frame of reference. It is an understanding how the world works that allows us to be able to approach the struggles, stresses, needs in an appropriate way. Many of us are trying to mop up messes in our lives. And every time we try to mop it, there's more mess to mop up because we haven't gotten to the root of the problem. If you will understand the theology, I am going to attempt to communicate to you today of how the world works. Then it will shift how you approach living and especially shift how you approach challenges in living. In 2 Chronicles 15, we're told in verse 3, for many days Israel was without the true God, without a teaching priest and without law. Verse 5 says, in those times, there was no peace to him who went out or to him who came in. For many disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the lands. Nation was crushed by nation and city by city, for God troubled them with every kind of distress. It says, there was no peace to him who went in or to him who came out. No peace means they were living in conflict. There was conflict. It says, first of all, there was personal conflict. No peace to him. Many of the problems of coping today are people unable to live with themselves. That's why they often go to devices to help them to cope. That's why they become dependent because they can't live with themselves and so they are dealing with inner conflict. But not only was there no peace to him, it says there was no peace to him who came out or who went in. That, that is, when he left home and when he came back home. So there was conflict in the family. When he entered back into his home, there was more conflict or disturbances. It says city rose up against city and nation rose up against nation. There was cultural conflict. We'll say city, urban conflict, international conflict, many disturbances. That was the situation. Ah, but here's where it gets interesting. The end of verse 6 says, for God troubled them. For God troubled them with their distresses. In the verse 6. Now, wait a minute. I would have thought with all that chaos, it would have said the devil troubled them. 
I would have thought with all this confusion, verse 6 would end by saying the devil troubled them with every kind of distress, but it says God troubled them. So now we're going to mess with your thinking a little bit because a lot of things you're blaming on, on the devil is God. There was no peace, the family disintegration, conflict, urban conflict, international conflict, and God says, if you're going to blame somebody, blame me. See, a lot of us are blaming the wrong person because here's how it works in the world. If God is your problem, only God is your solution. If God is the cause, only God is the cure. You say, but wait a minute. How can all this evil be given over to God? Because God uses the devil to carry out his dirty work. Because even the devil is not the devil. The devil is God's devil because the devil can only do what God allows him to do. So even if the devil is messing with you, it's by divine permission. For God troubled them with every kind of of distress. Let me put it another way. The spiritual always precedes the natural. The spiritual governs the natural. The heavenly determines the earthly. So if you have an issue on earth that has been caused by heaven, trying to solve it on earth is a waste of time. If it's an issue on earth caused by heaven, God troubled them, then you need heaven to come to earth to fix the issue on earth that heaven is responsible for, even if it's a problem because they were living in distress. In the Old Testament, you ran into the active wrath of God when God would directly bring pain about. He would rain down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. He would flood the earth with water. He would open up the earth and swallow up rebellious people. That would be the active wrath of God when God directly addressed things on earth, bringing about distress. When Jesus died on the cross, God's relationship to the world shifted. The Bible says that with the death of Christ, the world was reconciled to God. So some people believe the God of the Old Testament has to be different than the God of the New Testament. Because the God of the Old Testament, they say, seems so mean and judgmental while the God of the New Testament seems so nice and full of love. Well, there aren't two gods, but there are two relationships. In the Old Testament, before the permanent solution to sin was addressed, there was only a temporary solution and God directly dealt with things. In the New Testament, because the death of Christ reconciled the whole world to God, God could now relate to the world differently. Not because he changed, but because his relationship to the world changed. But predicated on the death of Christ, which is why Jesus Christ is the key and the center of all of life. So now, you do not face the active wrath of God. You face the passive wrath of God. Now that's spoken of in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to the end of the chapter, where it says, the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness of men who don't want to retain the knowledge of God. And then Romans 1, verse 24, 26, and 28 say the same thing. It says, therefore God turned them over. That means God released them to life without him. It says, because they did not want to retain the knowledge of God, God, like a dog on a leash, let the leash go so the dog could run away. 
So when men don't want God, he lets you not want him. And he lets go of the leash and you can go your own way. But when you do that, you also invite in the space between where God is and between where you want to go, that space becomes occupied with consequences. And so the consequences we are dealing with in our lives, in our homes, in our culture, we are dealing with them because there is a gap between where God is and where we are. Because they no longer wanted to retain the knowledge of God, it says God turned them over or released them to the consequences of their decision to be separated from him. And the built-in side effects that are the result. So the problems that people were facing on earth were predicated on what God was allowing to happen. Now the question is why? They were in distress. In other words, troubles they couldn't fix. And I know in this house today, there are troubles we can't fix. And you know you can't fix them because you've been trying to fix them for a long time and they either stay broke or look like they fixed but still break. He gives three reasons in verse three for this calamity. For many days, that is for an extended period of time, Israel was without the true God. Okay, problem number one. For many days, an extended period of time, Israel was without the true God. Israel was not without religion. Israel was not without church attendance. Israel was not without choir singing. Israel was not without religious programming. It says Israel was without the true God. The key word is the word true. They kept the name of God. They kept praying to God. They kept religious activity. They were doing all of that without the true God. So evidently you can have church without God. The biblical word for a false God is idol. That's the biblical word for a false God. An idol is any noun, person, place, thing, or thought that you look to as your source. Now, in third world countries, we would condemn their idolatry. In third world countries and in backward uh, 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 nations that haven't come into the, to the 20th and the 21st century, they may worship trees or rocks or nature, okay? We would condemn that. But in the West, we have designer idols. I mean, we don't worship trees and rocks. We have American idols. Uh, let, let me look at some of the idols that we have that have replaced the true God. We got the idol of, oh, let's see, race where my color trumps God. Where, I, where people get offended when you correct their blackness with the Bible. When folk get offended when you correct their whiteness with the Bible. Because their race is more important than God's rules. Where they wind up worshiping black being beautiful or white being right rather than both having to be biblical. Whenever your race is your source of your ultimate identity, your race is an idol and you are a false worshiper. Oh, let's look at uh, another designer idol. Politics is a designer idol. where you think God rides the backs of a donkey or an elephant. Politics is a designer idol when you're more Democrat than godly, when you're more Republican than God, when God says one thing, but you're still talking about what your party says. 
in Ezekiel 43, God says, how dare you bring the throne of your king and set it next to my throne? Like we, like we are equals. When God speaks, elephants got to sit down and donkeys got to back up. It's okay to be a Democrat. It's okay to be a Republican as long as the Bible can overrule either or both because nobody should own you but the kingdom of God. Uh, let's see. Do we have another designer idol? Let's see. Oh, yeah. Science. Science is a designer idol because science teaches your kids not an evolutionary theory, but an evolutionary fact. Atheistic evolution is uh, let's, uh, fairy tales for adults. It's a fairy tale for adults. Because in the name of science, they deny God. And they set up a whole system of divine denial based on that science. So because of that science, man becomes the ultimate definer of life. Man becomes the ultimate definer of meaning. Man becomes the ultimate definer of where God should be placed in the culture. When people elevate science, and science is a beautiful thing, but all science does is show how God does stuff. He says, there were idols. They're economic idols, they're class idols. Because of a certain amount of money or where a person lives or the car they drive, they have elevated themselves to the height of pride where they're better than other people who have been equally created in the image of God. So I can come in shapes and forms. So you don't have to be an overt God denier to be an idolater. All you've got to do is place anything or anybody in the place or the position of being the source of your identity. Then it doesn't matter how much you pray because you're praying to a false God, not the real God, because the real God not listening if you have another idol. Now why, why, why were they uh, worshiping a false God? Well, verse 3 tells us, because the second thing it tells us, it tells us is there was not a teaching priest. There was no teaching priest. It didn't say there were no preachers. He just said they weren't talking about nothing. They were talking smack. A lot of these problems that we have in our culture is because the church, Christians, have not risen to the occasion to be what God has called us to be and it's just showing up in the public square. If your life is falling apart and you're in personal distress, then my responsibility, a leader's responsibility, even another believer's responsibility, is to take the word, show you what God says about whatever you're dealing with, then give you practical steps to apply what God said. Then ask the Holy Spirit to take your practical steps of obedience based on what God said to bring change in your life. But what we got is a generation of folk who change books. They use this book for some things. They use human understanding for other things. They use popular opinion for other things. And they wind up living in distress. The third thing it says is there was no law. There was no law. You see, when there's no true God, no teaching priests, there are no rules. People make up their own rules. You see? They either have no rules or they have their own made up rules. You know, people come up with their own, you know, they, they walk around saying, I know my truth. You know your truth. No, it's either truth or it's not truth. But we want to adjust truth. We want to make truth relevant. It's okay to be relevant as long as you're not changing truth. 
And truth is whatever God says on any subject about what he speaks. That's truth. So if God says it, that is the word about it. Science just has to catch up. No rules, wrong rules, your own rules, no standard. Was there a solution? Now that you understand how the world works, the spiritual governs it. If God has caused it, you don't know anybody who can fix it. Unless it's God using that person. Verse 4 gives us a solution. Because verse 4 says, But in their distress, they turned to the Lord God of Israel. They sought him, and he let them find him. Ah. Key word, distress. In their distress, they turned to the Lord God of Israel. That's the same word of verse 6. God caused their distress. Verse 4 says, but in their distress, they turn to the Lord God, which means God will let it get bad enough, long enough till you wake up. Because it was in their distress. See, God will let it get well. He'll let us get addicted. He'll let us get into all the consequences of our sin. He will let, he will let you go down and down and down and down till the only way you can look is up. He won't let anybody fix it, any money be able to get you out of it. He will let the distress go down. But in their distress, when things got deep enough, bad enough, long enough, it says they called on, here it is, the Lord God. Oh, watch this now. When they returned to the Lord God, he let them find him. Ah. So, God created his stress. I told you about, you know, Sister Evans when, when, um, when, I, when I met her and she was not responding at the rate to which I was accustomed. My girlfriend was moving a little slow, so I had to help her sister out. So in Baltimore, there's this amusement park called Gwyn Oaks Amusement Park. It had a roller coaster that did this, but the roller coaster would like go out to the end like it was going to jump off and turn real quick. I said, give me two tickets. <laughs> we got on the roller coaster for two. The wilder the ride got, the closer she got. <laughs> By the time the ride was over, you thought only one person got on it. <laughs> Why did I buy two tickets? I bought two tickets to create distress. Because I knew the worst things got the closer she'd get. You see? Sometimes God has to put us on a roller coaster ride so that we move over and we slide over and we get a little closer and we get a little closer. So if you're in distress, don't let that drive you away, draw you near, closer, so that you're like Jacob and say, I'm not going to let you go until you answer me. And when you do that, when you get close and want to live for him, want to please him, want to honor him, want to exalt him, want to draw near to him, then heaven opens up and he lets you find him. He lets you find him. Everything visible and physical is preceded by that which is invisible and spiritual. So that if something needs to be changed or corrected in the visible physical realm, we must identify its invisible spiritual cause. Heaven has something to say about what's happening on earth. So many things are in chaos, out of order, in conflict in the world in which we live. On every level, whether it's people's personal lives or family disintegration, racial conflict, class conflict, political conflict, these earthly realities have a spiritual root. And if you skip the spiritual root, 
and just try to fix the visible fruit, then you won't get to the source or the solution to the issues that need to be transformed and corrected. God must be consulted if correction is going to take place and improvement is going to come in our lives, in our circumstances. Heaven rules. And when we understand that if we grab the spiritual, if we grab heaven and allow that to intervene in the circumstances of earth, then we will have put things in its proper order and proper perspective. As I like to say, if all you see is what you see, you do not see all there is to be seen. If we continue to only try to solve our earthly problems with earthly solutions, we will continue to live in earthly frustration and earthly failure. But if we will allow God's perspective, the reality of heaven, to interfere with and intervene with what we are dealing with on earth, then we will have positioned ourselves for real solutions, long-term solutions, because God doesn't make mistakes. In fact, if it's something God has allowed, that means only God can fix it. So let's stay in touch with heaven because earth is in trouble. We need to have earth touched with the power and presence of God in heaven so that order can replace chaos.